Greetings, dear listeners. The, oh, whoop, sorry about that. Uh, hi, welcome to the Dispatch Podcast. This is Jonah Goldberg, and I'll be your host today. Um, all the regulars are out except for me, and so uh, uh, like having uh, like eating a burrito before sex, someone had a really bad idea of having me host this podcast. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to talk about the uh, ever-expanding pool of GOP uh, uh presidential contenders we're going to talk about uh drama on capitol hill with the house freedom caucus and and kevin mccarthy and other things and we're going to talk about the uh um the atrocity in ukraine with the destruction of a really important dam and perhaps the start of the counteroffensive and other things uh joining me today i'm very excited about this i basically got my uh my my, my dream team together we have uh brother chris starwalt welcome and good to be with you and one uh, Michael Warren, um, who has, uh, who is, who is, who has bumped up the cumulative grade on dispatch voices for podcasts mm. by, uh, a whole letter grade. Uh, you have a very good dis uh, podcast voice. So, um, let's start with, uh, the, everyone in the pool. We got Mike Pence announced this week. He did a town hall. We got Chris Christie announced this week. Um, he hasn't done a town hall yet, although his, uh, announcement thing was more like um uh you know uh, clarence darrow's summation in the uh uh scopes trial and um uh that burgum guy um which i think is his official name on the bumper stickers uh has jumped into the pool and i, I think i might be missing somebody but we're now up to what 10 11 chris what do you make of it all well, first, it's good to be here uh, in, in one of the part of the mighty fleet trailing behind uh, the flagship podcast of the remnant. Uh, this is good. Um, I, so this isn't what I. So let me evade your question thusly. It's not what I think. Um, it's what I think of what other people think. And it is there is much consternation uh, from. Uh, the same people who are always wrong uh, because we're always wrong when it comes to presidential primary uh, races um, who say, oh, it's too many people. It's, it's too many people. It's, and Trump agrees with the premise. It's too many people. It's too many people. And I've said it to you before. I'll say it again. It doesn't matter how many people get in. It matters how many people get out. Uh, there can be 25 people running. There could be, it doesn't matter how many people are running. It matters if by the end of the year, I think Chris Sununu in his uh, interview talking about why he wasn't going to run said it pretty well. I might give people a little more time than he gave them, but basically said by Christmas, by the end of the year, if you don't have a viable path to the nomination, you need to be out of the race. And I think for Republicans, that's the truth. If you think that you might have a shot at being president, if you are a, let's say, a billionaire software uh, company developer uh, from North Dakota who nobody's ever heard of, you think you want to run, run doesn't do any harm. And in fact, I think it helps Republicans because they need to have the feeling of a real primary. They need to have the feeling of kicking it around, having the discussion, getting it going, creating a little energy around it. So Michael, um, feel free to respond to that as you yeah. like, but also um, um, I think the most interesting entrant into the race in some ways is Chris Christie. Um, I don't like everybody keeps saying, I mean, everybody, the whole MSNBC crowd, which loves that he's getting in, but they always have to preface it with it. He has no chance of winning. And I just, I feel like too many, enough of us were burned with the Trump can't win stuff that there should be a moratorium on, on that to a certain extent. Um, but what's interesting to me about Christie getting in is he's the first one to truly frontally go after Donald Trump by name in complete sentences, not, you know, without avoiding certain topics, right? I mean, Nikki Haley does it, but she doesn't put the name Trump in the same sentence with the criticism. And there's a lot of sort of, there's like, so far until yesterday with Pence and Christie the day before, there's been a lot of subtweeting um, in the GOP caucus, uh, our GOP campaign. And what's interesting to me about what, what Christie's going to do is, I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know if it's going to make everybody hate him. Um, but what I'm interested in is whether or not it moves the Overton window for the campaign generally. Does it make it easier for other candidates to criticize Trump? 
or do they read the room about people booing Christy and rush to Trump's defense um, and criticize Christy for, you know, shooting inside the tent? And I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm, I'm wondering what you think. Well, but doesn't it start here? And, and uh, let me preface with saying for people who say there's too many people in, I mean, we're still at half about of the number of candidates that were in in 2016 on the Republican side. So there it's a relatively small field if you take the small uh, sample size of the past couple of uh, of cycles. Um, but I think the very fact, and I've talked to some people about this, um, the very fact that there is a primary field with Donald Trump in the race um, suggests that there is going, we're going to see more uh, of what uh, Chris Christie is doing and now Mike Pence is doing. Like even give Ron DeSantis some credit. Uh, he is uh, going after Donald Trump, maybe in ways that uh, dispatch readers might not uh, want him to, but they're all seem to be focusing on, except for Nikki Haley, really, uh, on uh, the prize, which is you got to go through Trump. So Christie kind of opens the door, uh, makes it... Uh, makes it possible. But just the fact that people are challenging Trump, which is what they're doing. If you are running as a Republican uh, for the pres for, for the presidential nomination, you're challenging Donald Trump. Now, some of them maybe are running to become vice president, but it, in fact, that's what you are doing. And, and that's pretty remarkable given Trump's uh, apparent hold on the party. So I guess I'll be watching what Christie does, what Pence does, um, and how that influences how other people uh, are making the case, not just on the trail, but ultimately, let's look ahead to Milwaukee, August 23rd. What is that going to look like? Is everybody ganging up? Is, is, is Chris Christie going to resist the temptation uh, to beat up on Ron DeSantis? Because it's going to be there and he's going to want to do it. Um, Why would he resist? Maybe I don't know. Maybe he wouldn't resist. Maybe he maybe he won't resist beating up on DeSantis. But he seems to have a goal of taking on Trump alone. So you know, tr Trump solely. So uh, will he do that? Will he sort of keep his eye on the prize? Um, I don't know. I I, I just think it's it, it is less determined than ever before about what happens over the next couple of months, um, and and who ultimately raises the money, gets the. Uh, gets the the sort of momentum, uh, and who doesn't, and who decides? Uh, maybe it's not worth it. I, I I do think it's different than it was in 2016. For I think I think reasons. Meatball has a lot of reasons not to attack Chris Christie. Uh, I think Ronnie D should not be attacking Chris Christie. Uh, but I think if I, I think if I was uh, advising Chris Christie, I'd say swing freely, brother. Uh, <laughs> go go out there and and you know be triumph the insult comic uh, candidate if you want to. Uh, because look, the, I think what Mike Pence said in his announcement was more significant than what Chris Christie said. Mike Pence said that a person that, that a person who does what Donald Trump did should never be president, right? He should never be president. He said he was not fit for office. Yep. That's he it. Said he should, he said that a person who uh, 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 seeks to undermine the Constitution should never be president, and a person who at, who who basically asks what uh, Trump asked Pence to do should never be president again. And Mike Mike Pence is a long shot, uh, uh, according to the polls now, and he is of a group with I guess you still have to say Haley, but certainly Tim Scott uh, and Christie um, of long shots. But what Pence has done is, number one, say that magic word, the never, right? He was asked subsequently in an interview uh, about whether that would he sign the pledge. And he said, oh, I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll sign it. And I like Christie's response, by the way, to the pledge. He said, I'll treat the pledge with as much respect as Donald Trump did in 2016. Um, so, but for Pence, that, um, that putting that line in the sand is pretty significant and it will embolden others. The the thing for Pence, for the Republicans, there's going to be this tumultuous period between now and let's say Thanksgiving. Debates will start in August. It will get going. It will get weirder. It will get uglier. More people will probably get in. And then if you're Pence, what you want is, this is the same thing that Glenn Youngkin is thinking about with November, is that there will be a flight to quality 
uh, that DeSantis will turn into a Jeb sized suck hole. Uh, he's got the, uh, uh, he's got Jeff Rowe running his, uh, uh, super PAC, which, uh, we saw how well he did for Ted Cruz. <laughs> we saw how well, uh, that worked for Ted Cruz. Uh, and if, if uh, Ron DeSantis collapses, there will be a flight to quality and Pence is trying to set himself up as former governor of Indiana, former congressman, former vice president. Here I am. So I, I do have one question about this. Like I, I, I thought Pence's speech was good. I didn't see all of the town hall, um, but on this point about um, the pledge, right? I thought Christie's answer was as Kobayashi Maru as you can get, right? It is, it is, it was because everyone else has been sort of stuck in this bind of being asked to obey the rules, to have integrity, to 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 make a make a promise and keep it in a field where they're trying to run against a guy who will do none of those things and has no record of doing those things. And so it's sort of this really unfair thing. It's like, you know, you know, you, you promise to be as circumspect as you promise to be more circumspect than the escape monkey from the cocaine study. And so the, the thing is Pence's answer on that was bad. It was just bad. And I don't understand it because like, Pence has got real pros working for him. Pence has been around the block a few times. Why would you not murder board the five most obvious questions you would get asked um, when you decide to announce for president? You know, you say, okay, we're going to say he's unfit for office and he should never be president. And anyone who goes declares war on the Constitution has no business being president. And then someone's going to ask me, will you endorse him if he wins? What should I say, everybody? And the answer he gave was like, well, I always supported the Republican nominee and blah, blah, blah. So your, your consistency in supporting Republican presidents is greater than your belief that being at war with the Constitution makes you unqualified to be president of the United States and all that. I just thought it was very strange to me that it was a bad, to me, it was a bad sign that Pence had not come up with some version of like the Christie answer. Um, and well, you get, you can't be a little bit pregnant and Donald Trump can't be a little bit unfit for office. Right. right. Uh, and if you've said never, then never is supposed to mean never. And I, uh, I, I, I can understand the thinking behind Pence's misstep, uh, which is, well, we don't want to alienate people cause we want to be able to put the party back together at the end. So we don't want to say that. Uh, and that's probably like the beauty of this period of the campaign Nobody knows what works, so you might as well do what you want to do. It doesn't matter because nobody knows what's going to work in the end. So you grip it and rip it and, and be yourself. Um, you, can, you can't lie to a kid or a dog. You can't fool a kid or a dog, and, a, and you can't fool a primary voter either. Uh, so you might as well just be who you are. And if they like it, you're going to win. If they don't like it, they're not going to win. So I think that was an over – I think Pence overcooked that one. Well, I mean, it, it, it is – in some ways, uh, an answer that reflects who Pence is, which is he's right. a party man. He's a mm -hmm. traditional traditionalist in terms of, I mean, his critique of, of Trump was sort of, this guy is uh, out of bounds with what, you know, I mean, l l listen to what he said. I mean, it was not true when he said that Donald Trump promised to be a conservative president in 2016, and that's what we did. And and now he's not making that promise. But there, there's a sort of um, uh, there, there, there's a sort of uh, contractual uh, element to the way Pence, you know, Pence is talking about these things. And he's it, it just it, it 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 falls flat when you've just made that kind of moral case against the guy, and then say, yeah, but. Um, but if but if he's the nominee, I mean, yeah, he. I, I guess the other part of this is the is this stupid uh, RNC deal. Like you can't get on the debate stage unless you agree to sign it. Um, you can't make your case uh, to beat Trump if you can't get on the stage. So, you know, so it, it's really unfair, as you say, Jonah. But um, yeah, he's Pence has got to do better than that. How about the forty thousand small donors uh, for bad <laughs> debate rules? Uh, I forget the name of the guy who is uh, giving away Tucker uh, free Tucker T-shirts uh, to people who will give him a dollar. Uh, he's going to spend twenty bucks for every dollar that he raises, so that he can get forty thousand one dollar contributions to get on the stage. 
Um, the fact that the Republican National Committee does not understand what the rest of the political world now knows about small dollar donations, which were super cool in 2008 when people were using their AOL, uh, they, when they were when they were when they were donating their five dollars, doesn't mean anything now. It's a it's a you know g- getting people to give online contributions doesn't mean anything. And I will further complain. I will harump further to say this is why you let the networks pick their own criteria. This was a discussion I had with uh, Fox people when, when I was at Fox. We talked to the RNC about, you don't want that heat. We'll take the heat, right? Let us do, let us do it. Let us run our TV show and you can either sanction it or not sanction it. But don't get into this part and trying the, the idea, the obsession among Republican National Committee members with the debate process and trying to control the debate process has been a it's it's been a, a fixation for the members of the RNC for a long time and they have I think led themselves astray because what they don't have yet is a real debate schedule because they've got too much they've got too too, too much in the broth Chris what by what authority does the RNC even even claim to be the arbiter of debate. I mean, is there, uh, this may be a stupid question, but why, why do they have so much power when we know that the RNC has been, you know, waiting for, for years in terms one, of power? One of the way, one of the great ways in which the English language tortures people who want to learn it uh, is the word sanction. Uh, so the Republican <laughs> right. National Committee can sanction a debate and the way that they sanction a debate is that they will sanction anybody who participates in a unsanctioned debate. <laughs> uh, so you lose delegates. So they, they say in advance, okay, you can't, what the, the real potency isn't on the debate requirements. The real potency is this is what we'll do to you if you participate in an event that falls outside of our boundaries. And that goes up to and including multiple, having multiple candidates on the stage at the same time. Because remember, for the party, this is a massive fundraising tool, right? They get to sell tickets. They get their, their involvement in this is a great way for them to raise money for the party. It's a great way for them to raise visibility. So they're trying to do too many things at once. But the truth of the matter, and I think Tim Scott proved the, this concept when he was on The View this week and had this uh, difficult exchange with one of the hosts and then knocked it out of the park, hostile going into hostile or adversarial media environments is good. It's a good thing. This is something that DeSantis hasn't figured out. It is a good thing to face hostile questions and come through it. Donald Trump, if anyone can tell you, debates can be won. It can be done. Um, and the I will always remember, not to be uh, in the Wayback Machine, I'll always remember how Newt Gingrich created his campaign uh, which was in South Carolina being just awful to Juan Williams. Uh, just awful to Juan Williams. Juan asked him a question about Gingrich's plan to have children work in their schools, uh, mopping the floors uh, and something like that. And Juan would took deep offense to this and asked him about it. And Newt just went yard. He just went crazy. And the, the, the hall exploded. People got really excited about it. And that was the that was what launched Gingrich. So the Republicans trying to avoid difficult questions uh, is silly. You can't just put Hugh Hewitt up there and have him coo gently at them for the whole time and figure that you're going to get a good outcome. Well, and also, like, I mean, we have to move on to topics, but, like, uh, I agree with you entirely. Also, the, the great thing about doing the, the, the view and that kind of stuff is that it goes viral. Right. Right. I mean, like, your own side will, will amp it. No, you know, doing Steve Bannon show or Eric Bowling show doesn't go viral. It's narrow casting. Right. And, um, but, you know, maybe this is damning with faint praise, but Hugh Hewitt constitutes aggressive interviewing. Yeah, right, right, right. On, right. on big swaths Compa- of the right, sort right, of talk compared radio. Compared to the War and, Room podcast yeah. with Steve Bannon. Yes, that's right. Um, so, um, uh, next topic. The, so, words they know come easy um <laughs> i've been through the i've been I've, I've been on a roller coaster with all of with with kevin mccarthy and the house republicans i i think i was right when i predicted and i'm trying not to make predictions anymore but my on this podcast i predicted i think he wins the speakership 
but then the shot clock is on for how long he holds on to the speakership in the last for the last two months i kind of think well no maybe he's gonna hang in there for a while he's certainly done better than i and and a lot of other people had anticipated um i do think that one of the reasons why he's been a better he's been more effective at the job is he's the first republican speaker what in our lifetimes that actually wanted to be the speaker of the house rather than you know a a stalking horse president or something or you know he, he likes his cough he likes dealing with the, the the actually doing the actual job anyway um we now get the feeling that no the knives are actually going to come out for for kevin mccarthy once again um the house freedom caucus is everyone else has moved on from the debt ceiling fight except for the house freedom caucus they are still talking about it the way the russians talk about world war ii um <laughs> and it will just never go away fun fact when i moved to when i went to college in baltimore you know how like and so like you know the russians always are having stuff on tv about world war ii and it's always in their memory that was the way local baltimore news channels talked about the cults leaving baltimore <laughs> like and fair four nights away like i like i wasn't a big football guy i know the video of the trucks leaving the cult headquarters thing and leaving town one of the great hard because it was on constantly this was years after it happened do they did, the did they do like betrayals. a two minutes hate you know of of the ursay family like they just like screamed at them and it was you know and 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 now we will punch this guy <laughs> in effigy i mean it was like it was just it was everywhere but anyway fair uh, this is why we don't have me host this thing. Okay, so uh, uh, Mike Warren, bring some adult supervision into this and tell us what you think is actually oh. going on with the House Freedom Caucus, with the House GOP, Kevin McCarthy, Scalise, okay. Jews, whatever. <laughs> Leaving that last one aside, maybe for later in the podcast. Uh, the, I mean, look, the, the specifics of this in some way don't really matter what it is that right now the House Freedom Caucus or really like, you know, just like hardliners within uh, the caucus are are raising and uh, raising a stink about, um, you know, throwing up roadblocks and hurdles for leadership. Um, because if it's not this, which this all, like, I, I feel like I'm wasting time even getting into the details. It's essentially a procedural vote that the House uh, uh, leadership lost on Tuesday because conservatives were upset uh, about um, uh, about a different vote. Um, like, if it wasn't going to be this, it was going to be something else uh, because that's the nature of this very small majority that Kevin McCarthy has. It's the nature of the deal or the deals that McCarthy made in order to become speaker, um, which gave away a lot of the store. Now, you talk to people, and I talk to people who are experts on sort of how the House conference is operating, who say um, convincingly that by letting in, uh, by letting the insane people run the asylum a bit, giving them a little agency, um, that that actually gives them buy-in and they have reason to play play ball with leadership to actually get along and get something done and that has been true i mean you can see that in the debt ceiling agreement that everybody was surprised to see not only kevin mccarthy get but then sort of have the upper hand over the white house um, in those negotiations but what has always been uh looming in the back in the background is the fact that there are the majority is so narrow that even those people you brought in, there are still some hardliners, some House Freedom Caucus guys uh, who don't have the buy-in. Maybe they're not the chairman or the subcommittee chairman uh, of of, um, uh, of of the particular uh, you know uh, committee in question at the moment, and they have all the incentive to throw a wrench in everything um, because there's power when you can get just a few congressmen on the Republican side to get together. And that's what we are seeing. Now, maybe McCarthy gets out of this uh, current, you know, uh, we saw this earlier this week where the House Freedom Caucus basically was on the brink of agreeing to uh, uh, throw out a motion to vacate the chair, which is essentially a way to oust a speaker 
um, and then they step back from the break. Um, and then within within a few hours, you had this failure of this vote on the floor, this rule vote, uh, and and now McCarthy's back in trouble again. And now you have even you know Punchbowl News has this interview with Steve Scalise, the number two, the House Majority Leader, um, who is seen as the guy who could rise if McCarthy falls. Um, and Scalise is throwing in some dr- drama into all of this drama by saying, you know. Essentially, ah, McCarthy's got a problem with these conservatives. He's got to figure it out. The McCarthy people say, no, it was Scalise who screwed it up on the floor. It's it's all a mess and it's all drama because it's just it's on a knife's edge. And every time you think the House Republicans have uh, nipped this problem in the bud, it comes back around. And at some point there will be a limit. And it's not even really McCarthy's fault. It is somewhat of his fault. But, he, you know, it, it, it's. <laughs> it will not end well. The question is, when will it end? Chris, uh, should Steve Scalise wear a Bane mask so that you know Scalise rises? I saw the fire I saw begins. What, I saw what his uh, the his I don't know whether it was pack or whatever spent at the Capitol Grill, and it would be uh, it was like one hundred and thirty thousand dollars they spent at the Capitol Grill. So it'd be a weird look for the CG, but you know whatever. <laughs> um, uh, Best shrimp cocktail on Pennsylvania Avenue by far. Uh, get it, get it with the crab cake sauce instead of the cocktail. You know, best shrimp cocktail on Pennsylvania Avenue is not exactly. <laughs> that's not nothing. It's not nothing. I mean, it's like that's not you know, best Oktoberfest in Orlando. It's something. It's best no, oysters no. in South Dakota. <laughs> oh my gosh, you people do not eat with the correct gluttony. You're not paying the correct attention to I to the. Uh, we'll have Jonah. I'll take you guys on a shrimp cocktail tour. Uh, of the steakhouses will go from the Palm to Joe's to the Capitol Grill. It'll be great. Um, okay. Actually, you know, that would be a great premium thing for dispatch subscribers is the annual Chris Starwalt uh, shrimp cocktail crawl. Yeah. We'll get it. <laughs> um, we'll get a bus and we'll just take people <laughs> for the experience to get the t-shirt. Um, okay. So the federal fiscal year expires at the end of uh, September. And this is about that. Uh, they need a continuing, re- they're, they're, we're operating on a, a quasi uh, continuing resolution or whatever we call it, we passed in January in the lame duck, right at the, at the very end. And the fight to do that is going to be extraordinary, right? Um, it was in both Biden and McCarthy's interest to kick the debt ceiling for a long time, right? They, they both wanted the breathing room because they don't want to have to deal with uh, their uh, insurgent members. Uh, either of, neither of them want to deal with their insurgent members on that question again um, because it's just not a good place to, for brinksmanship. Uh, we don't know what would happen but uh, if, it, if we ever pierced that, but it would not be good. Uh, and so they don't want to play that. And of course, for Biden... I, and I want to say before I become rankly cynical, the Biden and McCarthy both deserve credit for doing what they are supposed to do, right? They did their jobs uh, and at some risk to themselves. They both had longer term interests that were involved, but it was the, they both did. They both operated the government how it's supposed to operate in in this little piece. Um, but for McCarthy, the long summer and into the fall of Matt Gates leading the charge of the um, Freedom Caucus of the Freedom Caucus. I think it was 11 members who voted against the rule. They were voting against a rule to advance legislation that they wanted, right? It was uh, banning, banning gas stoves and a couple of other things. And they were, vo- they were voting that down. And it was very telling. I forget which member it was who said that it was personal animus, that he was uh, doing it to punish McCarthy because he had a bill that he said, Andrew Clyde of Georgia had led, had wanted legislation that would protect bump stock uh, kinds of stocks for uh, pistols that uh, McCarthy had said, yeah, we'll bring your bill forward. And when they told him, he said when they told him, ah, there's some actual problems with the bill that we have to work out, so we can't do it this time. That's when he said, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll I don't want to overstate it, but I talked to several current and former members to take a poll. 
this is the worst mutiny that they've ever seen in terms of not following the party line because where you are supposed to vote against is when the freedom caucus did this before it's happened before but they went to boehner and said we're not voting for the rule and so you can take it down if you want or you can crash and burn uh on television but we're we're not voting for it they surprised the leadership with this and the intent was to embarrass and that tells you uh because as Mike points out, not a big deal in terms of the the course of the Republic, not a big deal. But in terms of try the the enmity inside the conference, it's significant. And what they're going to do to McCarthy between now and the end of September is going to be pretty ugly. And it will be happening against the backdrop of a intensifying presidential candidacy. You notice or uh, nominating process. Trump said, you got to tell the Senate to default. You got to default. Uh, DeSantis came out and basically whipped against because it's not in their interest. Tim Scott voted against uh, because that's not what the primary wants to. That, that's not what that's not what Republican primary voters want to hear. So it's going to get he may, you know, like Kevin McCarthy really surprised in getting the speakership and he and, and he surprised in getting the debt ceiling left passed. Uh, but the hard part is still to come. So we're going to do this. Uh... Uh, McLaughlin group exit question style. Um, unless you want to do it Gangnam style, but it's, it doesn't really work on us. <laughs> I wouldn't podcast. even know how. I don't know what that means. Uh, um, whoop, Gangnam style. All right. So, uh, uh, Maggie, now I got the earworm in me. Oh, um, zero to 10. This time next year is. Kevin McCarthy still Speaker of the House. I ask you, more Tottenham. I ask you, Chris Steyerwald. <laughs> Ten being metaphysical certainty, zero being no chance. He's uh, he's a dead man walking already. Wrong. Cornflakes <laughs> with banana. <laughs> um, and uh, R.I.P. That show. I did. I enjoyed doing it, and it was a good show. But um, I will say that Kevin McCarthy has a seven, s- simply because who else? Who you got? Right? Um, if Scalise is part of a mutiny, the Scalise is in a, a Pentian posture. Uh, he, in order for him to be a viable candidate to replace McCarthy, he has to demonstrate to the normies that he is a normie and not part of taking down McCarthy. And if he is seen as being a traitor, Elise Stefanik will uh, eat his liver uh, and she will get through, but she doesn't enjoy the confidence of the normies. Patrick McHenry uh, uh, is trying to be a more mainstream figure uh, than he was before. And his bow ties are slamming, but uh, I don't know. So th- you, you have to, ha- it, it's, it's, it's not that they don't want McCarthy. Nobody really wanted McCarthy. It's that there isn't a viable alternative. Right. Fun fact. Pensian posture is from the Apocrypha of the Kama Sutra, but we can talk about that another time. Uh, that familiar. Oh, um, that's where you eat the burrito. I guess <laughs> that's right. Um, Michael Warren, I ask you, zero being zero chance, metaphysical impossibility, 10 being it's, an, it's a lock that Mike Pence will be still speaker this time next year you mean kevin mccarthy mike pence being speaker that's, that's the a, twist that that's is a, the twist the that, writers came up I, with a good one on that one i'm sorry that's the jameson's talking <laughs> kevin mccarthy uh, I, speaker no yes maybe i give it a five and i concur with with Steyerwalt's analysis here except that i i think scalise has a little more of a claim to it uh than than maybe you give him chris credit for chris because he is he is thinking and maneuvering and he's much savvier um i think even than mccarthy in sort of managing the um relationships across the conference and uh he has uh he has been angling for this for a higher office within house leadership. He has uh, played his cards mostly correctly. I would say there were moments when he was going to challenge McCarthy for leader uh, when the, when they were in the minority and he, he ended up not doing it and even sort of, you know, 
denied that he was even interested in it, which I think was a good play on his part. So um, I do think it is a similar situation, like with the defenestration of Boehner, where who is going to step up? Um, and then you ended up with, you know, you know, McCarthy flailing and, and Paul Ryan sort of being having the job forced onto him. Um, in this situation, though, I think Scalise wants it. I think he could conceivably cobble together a, uh, a co- you know, a- enough support for it within the conference. And you notice he kind of is keeping his distance from McCarthy on a lot of this. Or, hey, I'm doing my own stuff as majority. I, I'm I worried to- about the I conference. totally agree. I totally agree. But <laughs> yeah. that's the hard, that's my point is it's the hard one. Yes. He has to, he can only have it after McCarthy goes down. And he has to support McCarthy as McCarthy is fighting. So he has to yeah. he has to dance between alienating what Boehner used to call the Chucklehead Conference and alienating the normies. And that's that's a tough one because if he fights too hard to save uh, McCarthy, he loses the Chuckleheads. And if he fights if he doesn't fight strenuously enough, he loses the other guys. So he's he is certainly an able politician, uh, but it'll be a, a tightrope. The uh... Your guys' understanding of what a lightning round is needs work. Um, but did you say slow bolts? Rounds? I did it's say lightning round. It's one of those slow bolts that ripples heat across lightning. the prairie. It's heat yeah. yeah, it's one of those kinda, big, yeah. long bolts. That the correct answer is four. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last and least prone to jocularity, alas, is the uh, right, technically we have to say alleged, right? Because we don't know for sure. I am fairly convinced that the Russians did this for various reasons, but. Um, a fairly crucial dam in the Kherson region, region was uh, uh, blown up. Um, there are a lot of outlets that are using more passive language than even that. Um, lots of people calling it a disaster when I, I think uh, Noah Rothman has it right. It's an atrocity. Um, and there are reports that the counteroffensive is nigh, if not already underway but it's just not playing out like a world war ii movie um and weirdly as 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 all of this is happening you have vivek ramaswamy going all in on uh basically handing chunks of ukraine to the russians this is his idea of statescraft um as as a way to entice russia into a security cooperation agreement with the united states uh which is uh we're not going to spend a lot of time dissecting that, <laughs> but um, uh, and you had Kevin McCarthy saying basically more aid is on hold, and you have Tucker Carlson coming out. Um, I would argue just essentially propagandizing for Russia on his new Twitter show. It's a it's a, a lot of moving parts. Um, Mike, why don't you start off? What do you make of all of it? Well, I don't have a lot to say about because I just frankly don't know enough about the movement of the counteroffensive and what this means. I can only trust what I read, which is, uh, which leads me to believe along with everything else that we know that this is uh, a Russian effort. I could be wrong about that. And uh, this was a, uh, the, 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 the destruction of this dam was a Russian operation. I could be wrong. I think it's not wrong to question that, that narrative uh you you got you got to ask questions and to act as if ukraine is sort of uh you know look at what they do with um you know with uh with press credentials um they're they're they are not a wide open western style democracy by any stretch of the imagination but it, it stands to reason that russia benefits much more from the destruction of this dam than ukraine does but what you what i'm sort of more interested in from uh, from a, the domestic side of things is the way in which populists, conservatives, uh, you know, are talking uh, about this. Um, you mentioned Vivek, you mentioned, um, you know, the, the, the hold on Ukraine aid. Um, it was heartening to hear from Republic, other Republican presidential candidates, much more forthright uh, support. You heard it from Pence. You heard it from Christie. Um, you've heard it from Nikki Haley. Forthright support for Ukraine. But the Tucker Carlson ten-minute Twitter show um, was was so pro-Russian that it the Russian propagandists in Russia seemed to be taking cues from it. Um, 
that 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 he's the sort of the the guiding star now for how they talk about it on Russian TV, which I think there was is a Russian just, TV show that said that that where they said Tucker was the basically the only reliable source for information. Exactly. Now. I mean, which is weird. I I, get, I don't even know what to do with that. But just combine that with Tucker's blatantly and naked anti-semitic appeals in his hatred and for uh of of vladimir Zelensky, um and and the way that he i mean the the sort of rat-faced language it it is so it is so disgusting and it just reminds you that um, you should probably stop for a second and explain to listeners what you're oh, referring to. I'm sorry. Most people haven't seen his Twitter show. That's a good and point. And it's accuse him of I've, trafficking anti-Semitic I've, stuff as fair as it might be. They don't know what you're talking about. I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm so outraged about it. Um, uh, Tucker Carlson's you know new Twitter show. It's called Tucker on Twitter, I think. Um, uh, he released episode one. It was a 10-minute, essentially, essentially a monologue like what he would do on his Fox show uh, in which he sort of explained a little bit at the end that he will be, you know, on Twitter doing this show uh, that he will be speaking the truth. This, these are his words. And if there is any sort of censorship, for Twitter that he will be leaving, but the bulk of it was essentially a, uh, uh, a criticism of um them, those people in the establishment who won't let you question what happened uh, with this Russian dam, uh, essentially uh, uh, parroting Russian propaganda that this that it, it doesn't benefit Russia to cl- to to blow up this dam and close off uh, the ability of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. It's clearly the Ukrainians uh, who who stand to benefit. Uh, and then he goes on a rant about um, about Zelensky. Uh, claiming that you know, uh, you know, he is uh, he, uh, insinuating he has some sort of um, like homosexual like love affair with uh, Lindsey Graham. Uh, that's like obsessed with the killing of Russians. Um, again, calling Zelensky rat faced, um, trafficking in all kinds of the kind of things that even at Fox, even sort of in a in a studio, uh, there are people who are potentially going to say maybe that goes a little too far this is like tucker unleashed and it's so ugly and so disgusting um i just i just sort of have to register my my disgust and complain about it and Um, the specific anti-semitic part is because he talks about how Zelensky is jewish jewish and and wants to kill as a war on christian christians or oh yeah he's anti-christian i mean look the rat face thing i mean he's very much like straight out of like european you know 19th century uh uh you know anti anti anti-jewish anti-semitic propaganda stuff as well um he you know the sort of the money aspect of it he's a comedian turned oligarch i mean it's all there the dog whistle is so loud that i can hear it um not just the dog so like it, it it it's all uh i think i tucker knows exactly what he's doing and um and i just find it disgusting Brother Steyerwald, we, we we can continue the seminar on on Tucker, or do you have other? I, I have not. I have not heard uh, what Tucker said. Um, do you find it believable that it was in a, in a, inappropriate or offensive in some way? I, it is possible that he may <laughs> have not followed the boundaries of uh, decorum uh, in the conversation, and certainly, uh, if what Mike says if that's if that's how that went down, that would be a. A, a turn to a turn toward anti-Semitism uh, a, would be uh, most discouraging. Um, but I will say this: the clock is running on the Ukrainians, uh, and they know it. And uh, the the tide. So we know about the nationalist right in the United States being opposed to this war from the beginning. It has become a litmus test. Uh, this is why Ron DeSantis staggered around the issue uh, multiple times uh, to, and, and trying to correct and then overcorrecting. And <clears throat> the, um, the MAGA base equates support with Ukraine with um, uh, same-sex attraction, uh, equates it with uh, there are certainly currents of anti-Semitism in it. 
Um, it is uh, it is a no go zone for those folks. I will be very interested to see what Trump ends up having to say as this goes forward, um, because right now Trump's answer is I'll solve it in a day. You put me in 24 hours, it's over. How are you going to do it? Well, I'm not going to tell you how I'm going to do it because I don't. We don't talk about our strategy. This is a this is a well known Trump approach, uh, but I think the demands on this from many of his core supporters are intense. Um, and this is, in fact, an issue that <clears throat> there's a lot of reasons why the D D Democratic Party, particularly Joe Biden, is more likely than the Republican Party right now to win in the next general election. And Ukraine is part of it because it so sharply divides Republicans. Uh, there, is a, there is an intense hatred of this endeavor uh, by many, and some of them, <clears throat> it's rooted in a genuine sort of uh, Ron Paul uh, isolationist kind of energy. And then there are those darker places we talked about. But for many of them, this is a absolute bright line distinction. And they have decided that Ukraine is bad news. There's that component. But I uh, don't know if you saw the uh, piece in the New York Times this week, talking about the Nazi symbols inside the Ukraine, uh, the military, the, the patches, yeah, the patches that are worn and <clears throat> this kind of stuff. The, the, the clock is running. And having talked about the counteroffensive for so long and prepared everyone for this and talked about it, I get the sense, well, as a domestic political consideration, um, the tolerance for how long this can go on is... There, there's a limit. McCarthy knows it. Biden knows it. Everybody understands this. And um, the, o the open-ended nature of this is not politically feasible uh, in the long run for the United States. There will have to be um, some sort of, there will have to be a negotiated end to this conflict at some point. And uh, I pray that the Ukrainians are so successful in the coming months uh, that this matter concludes uh, in a, a way that is, is most beneficial, most favorable to them. I don't know anything about how to fight a war. I don't know how it goes. But I think that the political realities in Europe and in, in the United States are such that this isn't going to, it will not persist at these levels for another, what has this been, a year and a half? So it's not going to be another year and a half uh, at these kinds of, what is it, $75 billion. It's not, it's not going to persist at this level. And so pray for Ukraine. So I'm going to uh, use a moderator's privilege and co-founder of the dispatch's privilege and ranch here, here for here. a second. Um, I, look, I agree with you. I, I don't think you closed the loop on the point, though, which is that, yeah, there's a big chunk of the base right that hates, the, hates helping Ukraine. But there's also a big chunk of Republicans that is really in favor of helping Ukraine. Exactly. Right? That's the point. I usually, you didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Out. But that's that. And that's what makes it so hard. Right. It's a that, wedge yeah. issue for Republicans, which yeah. is why it's a great issue for Democrats. Right. Right. So I agree with that. Um, I, I do think it's worth pointing out, first of all, that if there's a Venn diagram with three circles, one is adamantly opposed, one is adamantly in favor, and then there's the shrug emoji in the middle where they just don't know. Um, a lot of people in the shrug emoji are there because they're wildly misinformed about this. I'm not saying that they're dumb. I'm not saying that they're bad citizens or anything like that. But if you're listening to Vivek and Marjorie Taylor Greene, and you can go down a list of people about what the issues are here, um, uh, you're going to understandably come to what I think is the wrong position on a lot. Um, so that's point one. Point two, just to talk about the actual sort of foreign policy elements of this. I'm pretty disgusted. I, I, again, I understand the reluctance to get out ahead of things. You know, the drone strike on the Kremlin turned out that maybe it actually was the Ukrainians. You don't want to, like, get burned. But the Russians we've known for over a year now, or about a year, mined that dam, right? They put explosives in that dam. We knew that. They didn't deny that. Zelensky asked back in October for international monitors to be on the dam to prevent something like this from happening. So that right there suggests that 
Ukraine was worried this would happen. Russia was worried that they wouldn't be able to do it if they needed to. Russia has a long history of doing this kind of thing. But then there's the, the, the more important point is this is not using a weapon of mass destruction, but it's one click shy, right? If, 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 if this was instead of inundating tens of thousands of homes, ruining villages, ruining crops, poisoning an ecosystem, killing all of these animals, they killed, they drowned 300 animals in a zoo. Um, if this had been done through low grade radiation, everyone would recognize it for, for what it is. But because it's inundation with water, everyone's like, ah, you know, it's a disaster. It's, you know, whatever. And the thing that disgusts me and worries me about this is that the Russians are watching the reaction to this. And on the day that this happened, you know what the UN Twitter feed was dominated with? The need to celebrate International Russian Language Day. Nuh-uh. Yeah. And I'm not saying they didn't condemn this thing, but they, they condemned it as if it was an act of God, right? They said, oh, this is very worrisome. We need to blah, 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 blah. This is, this is Putin watching to see what he can get away with. And, 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 and as, as, as some of the guys on the Telegraph podcast were making this point, um, Dom Nichols in particular, even if this was an accident, Russia owned the dam. They controlled the dam. They were responsible for the dam. They wouldn't be responsible for them if they hadn't invaded the friggin' country. So they, they own this, even if it's an accident. And, um, and if the reaction from the world is muted on this, there's no talk of kicking them out of their security council. There's no talk of like, you know, new la layers of weapons. The conclusion that Putin can reasonably draw is, okay, so let's turn up the gain on this a little bit. Maybe we'll have a low grade radiation leak from the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. That'll scare a lot of people, right? That'll get the, you know, and, and the, the sort of passive way a lot of people are reacting to this, I think, is really dangerous in terms of the sort of the step function sort of appeasement thing that got us here in the first place. If, if Obama had, you know, Obama's reaction, you can go down a long list of things. You got Trump stuff. Um, you know, Putin spent 20 years taking little bites out of places without the West doing very much about it. It is now, I think, highly probable, if not clear, that they committed a major new war crime by doing this. It is against the Geneva Convention. Um, and everyone is like, well, Russians going to Russia. And uh, I think it's a very dangerous way to look at that. It has knock-on effects with how China looks at things. And... Um, and I find it just very disappointing, you know, maybe, again, maybe some people are keeping their powder dry, waiting for the declassification of intelligence so they don't get out ahead of a story that's going to blow up on them. I get that impulse, but a little more outrage, and you can pepper it with phrases like, if true, right, um, would be better. Well, the, the uh, moral equivalizing that is going on, I referenced with the time story about the, the Nazi patches. Uh, and uh, certainly, Mike, I take your point about press freedom seriously, but the concerns about uh, the restrictions of the press in uh, Ukraine, you know who else restricts the press during wars? The United States of America. Uh, Ernie, uh, Ernie Pyle filed his copy through censors, uh, and to be embedded in the, with the United States military, you have to put on the uniform you got to go over there uh, and you've got to agree to say what they say. So I, there is, my point is the, there's this moral equivalizing going on that has coming in on the left side too. And so we have the, this is, this is the anxiety and the fatigue and you just scared the smoke out of me uh, when you talked about, I hadn't thought about that, about a leak staging it as an accident and just for Putin to continue to raise anxiety about this has to end, this has to end because something really bad is going to happen here. Uh, thanks for ruining uh, my peace of mind, Jonah. That's what I hear. Right? But it's important to remember that I'm, I'm moderating this podcast as a way to send a signal to everybody that I should never replace Sarah again. Um, <laughs> hence all the Kama Sutra and burrito jokes. Like, like I am punishing my colleagues for putting me in this position. Um, you want Jonah? Okay, let's give, give him Jonah. Anyway, I'm sorry, Mike, go ahead. Uh, well, look, the only, the only other thing to add to this is because we haven't talked about the, the, the Biden element, which is um, 
if one of the weakest wanna... elements on the periodic table. Uh, exactly. Sorry, go on. Uh, B.I., <laughs> I think on. it is. Uh, what's Come the weight on. of that? Um, Long half-life, though. There you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, unstable, though. Um, so, uh, the, which is that while while Democrats are, uh, on the political side of things, while Democrats are sort of basically united on Ukraine, except for maybe the far left, I mean, Biden has not exactly been um, been much of a leader on this. I mean, it, which I get the sense just from his own White House's uh, uh, statements and his own statement, like he doesn't actually want to be uh, seen as being on the, too much on the side of Ukraine uh, in this. And I think that um, you compare it to say what what the what the Prime Minister of the UK said um, yesterday, you know, called it a new low uh, about, about the, this damn explosion. The United States response, uh, official response is sort of like, we're waiting. And I get that. I get why they're doing that. I get why there might be strategic reasons for doing that. But if you want to talk about um, a sort of a wasted opportunity for Biden to kind of be um, much more out front in um in in defending Ukraine here, I I, I just think it's uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm disappointed obviously in the Republicans um, who are sort of taking the Russian line here, but um, but but you know uh, Biden doesn't want to be there either, and that is a concerning element to to all of this as well, which is um, you know is there going to be uh, very little domestic political support in the next six months for this? And how much does Biden uh, bear the blame for that, for, for not sort of more forthrightly defending American interests um, in Ukraine? I don't think he believes there's much American interest. All right. So um, we never came up with a topic for not worth your time segment. Um, what about so, the fire? We haven't said anything about oh, Canada's. Yeah, oh, you mean Canada's, Can- Canada's aggression? Yeah, exactly. The un, un, the naked Canadian aggression uh, of uh, their attack on the United States with smoke. So, I mean, if, how would you phrase that as a not worth your time question? Well, I Canada, would say, not worth your time? Well, Canada, not <laughs> smoke, worth your time. Not worth your time? Can- Canada, not worth your time. My youngest man child, who is uh, through the, the ministrations of hockey, has become a... Uh, for some reason, an intense enthusiast for Canada. Mm -hmm. And I'm not anti, or he's making me anti-Canada. I wasn't anti-Canada before, but uh, when I think about- Negative polarization hits the Starwald household. Exactly. (laughs) When I think about 13th grade, when I think about uh, the uh, America's hat, I become resentful and the fire is really just intensifying that. So Canada, not worth your time. Can can I say that- um Herschel Walker was not wrong that the bad air was coming from somewhere else. We just didn't Ooh, know. We just didn't know cuts. that it was coming from inside the continent. You know, uh-huh. that's that's it wasn't coming from China. It was coming South from Park Canada. was right. South exactly. Park Blame right. Canada. That's uh, right. They're not well, even a real country anyway. Uh, yeah. Canada. Apparently it is worth our time. Like we should we should be uh, we should be manning the border at this point if they're sending over there their uh uh their smoke so this is um, this they're is not sending summer- their best air <laughs> 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 frankly <laughs> frankly but th- this is the a summertime version of what the rest of america has to endure every winter when it snows in new york and washington and people who live in tempe arizona are like why are we still doing blizzard coverage and it's like well because the studios are here and we had a hard time getting to work so my apologies to all of americans who have had to listen to everyone in New York and Washington complain about it because it's weird and it's, I hate it. Well, uh, as the husband of an Alaskan, um, I can tell you like, you know, my wife's reaction to this was welcome to every summer in Alaska. Yes. My Uh, my Jessica said the same thing. It made her homesick for California. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like Northern California is just, you just get smoke and stuff. I will say it's, 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 you know, it's, it's going to be a while before Canada comes back up as a topic on this podcast. I wrote a cover story for National Review titled Bomb Canada. And um, the cover was, and I always felt bad about this. It was the Canadian mounted police in full uniform with the word wimps across the top. And 
I didn't like that because part of the argument of the article is that the Canadian, the, the Mounties were actually represented the good old Canada that Canada was ceasing to be. But a um, couple points about this. One, lest there are people out there who doubt that there is a firewall, a high wall between church and state in terms of the business side and the editorial side at National Review, that story came out the week that we began what was supposed to be a multi-issue ad buy from the U.S. Canadian Friendship oh, no. Society. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, and no, no one on the editorial side told the business guys that this was coming. So, like, for those of you, like, the, the vulgar Marxists out there who think, you know, advertisers buy all the content and all that kind of stuff, you know, that it doesn't always work that way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, sorry about the ads, though. Uh, we were uh, super excited to have them. But then, you know, when you said you were going to bomb us, I thought, hey, let's maybe let's maybe pass on that one for a while. <laughs> sorry. Oh, that sorry boot? about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. What's that all about? And um, uh, second, and I, I feel actually kind of strongly about this. Um, we all know that there are certain foods we might have talked about this at one point um chris uh there are certain foods that are dominant in america but they don't have he hegemony yes, right so like yes, yes. new york style pizza it's close to hegemony but like the the new haven guys and there's you know the midwestern with the little squares and all that there are competitors you know there are little yeah there are holdouts of of you know of rebels that need to be crushed by new york style pizza um disagree but go on and then there's uh but the the new york bagel has complete and total dominance. No one questions that, you know, you might be able to get good bagels in Chicago or LA or it's hard in DC. Um, but the bagel that you get there is the New York bagel. And it is worth going to Montreal to have the Montreal bagel. Because I've looked deeply into this. Word, say word. And the Montreal bagel has just, it's like, it's like, you know, the, the, Hole and Rosens versus the Tudors, whatever, and they can all trace back their their lineage to whatever. The Montreal Bagel came to the United came to North America the same time, has just as much right to claim Absolutely. that it is the true and authentic bagel um, in North America. Same kind of immigrants from Poland came, and the Montreal Bagel is different than the Ameri the the New York Bagel. It is it's more like a Bialy. Yes, and um, it's excellent. I think it's really good. I, I, you know, I'm a New York jingoist. I'm a bagel jingoist. But um, if I had been born and raised in in Montreal, I could see saying, "Well, obviously, this is the better bagel." The um, crowd hammer, the crowd hammer doctrine. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, so that's worth pointing out. And then, lastly, if you ever go to, so you've been to Montreal, Chris. I love Mon Montreal. Is fabulous. Have you noticed that the normal Judeo Christian Western Post Enlightenment compass does not actually work in Montreal, and that the South on city maps is not actually South. Oh yes, that's right. I forgot about that, and I've been I've been lost doing it because it's oriented because the city's orientation is wrong. It's incorrect. Right. They consider the one side of the river to be one thing, and the other side of the river, like one one side is east and one side is west, but the river actually doesn't run that way, and so it it messes up the the whole thing and i think that's probably the real reason why this smoke is coming down is it tore a hole in the in the fabric of reality and the stygian mist is coming up from below and uh, it is ruining everybody i i hope that it's ruining their poutine because they don't deserve it <laughs> they don't deserve to enjoy their poutine if this is what they're doing to us and with that I want to thank you guys, Chris Starwalt, Mike Warren. Thank you for doing this. And uh, uh, we really do hope Sarah comes back soon. And uh, <laughs> please, <laughs> um, Sarah, us. if you're listening. Um, and uh, we'll see you all next time.